Okay, I was given a fairly broad remit of what to talk about, so I've titled it Clare History and Genealogy, but I will stray to things that are relevant to the whole country and I will focus in on things that are particularly relevant to the curtains. Uh, if you want to follow the notes and the links for the talk, all you need to write down is the address of the webpage, pwaldron.info forward slash curtain to the capital C. Um, I'm recording this with Camtasia and will eventually, hopefully, get around to putting up the recording on YouTube and there'll be a link there at the bottom of the page. So let me begin. Since this is a, a surname gathering, I guess it started out as a clan gathering, which to me suggests you're all related. And then you do your DNA tests and you find some of them are half of group J from Saudi Arabia and some of them are half of group Or from County Clare. So. They're probably not all related, so I'm still sure the common surname gives you a lot, a lot in common, even if you don't have common Y DNA. But I thought I'd begin by saying a little bit about naming customs in Ireland, because I find visitors from overseas, especially and visitors from the modern era who don't live in the 18th and 19th century, like historians like me, do get a little bit confused. Um, Ireland was a country for many years with three languages. The Irish language was our native language going back many centuries and millennia, and that's what the ordinary people spoke and still speak in the Gaeltacht areas. And the Gaeltacht areas, if you look at the census returns, you see were a lot larger in the early 1900s than they are today. And St. Patrick came here in the fifth century and converted us to Christianity. And the church has always operated in Latin. And those of you who looked at the old genealogical records know that a lot of the old parish registers were written in Latin. And the Normans came in the 1100s and eventually we became part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland from 1801 to 1922. So government work went on in the English language. So you had three languages being used to record the same people, and you're bound to have variations. Surnames came in roughly a thousand years ago. Uh, I'm living in Killaloo, which was where Brian Baru, one of the great high kings of Ireland, ruled from until he was killed at the Battle of Clontar on Good Friday, 1014, a thousand and three years ago. So three years ago, we had big celebrations for the millennium. And we think of O'Brien as being one of the first surnames. It meant descendant of Brian that applied to the descendants of Brian Baru, and that's roughly the time when the Irish began to use surnames. And that's probably several hundred years earlier than in most European countries. The original Irish surnames generally began with the prefix Mac. Mock is the Irish word for a son, so Mockertine means the son of Curtin. And other surnames begin with the prefix O, which just means grandson of. So O'Brien technically began as the grandson of Brian, but it continued to be used as a surname by the great-grandsons and the great-great-grandsons, and nowadays by the 30 times great-grandsons. Then the Normans came in with their own collection of surnames, and they had different prefixes. My name uh, was Waldron for many years. My ancestors were in the Irish Constabulary and then the Royal Irish Constabulary, and probably didn't speak much Irish. But in 1916, we had the Easter Rising, and in the years leading up to that, there'd been a great revival of the Irish language. So my grandfather decided that he should really go back to an Irish language version of his surname, but he didn't know what it was. So he started to call himself Sean O. Walter had, just put a no in front of it. And that carried on for a number of years until my aunt went to university in Dublin, studying Irish, and her professor was a man called Douglas Hyde, who ended up being the first president of Ireland under the 1937 constitution, but was appointed to that office, not because he was a politician, but because he was a great scholar of the Irish language. And he took my aunt aside one day and he said, the Waldrons are not Gaelic, they're Normans. Your name in Irish should be De Waldrona, not O Waldrona. So I'm sorry to Waldrona to some people. And my father's double first cousin, also became a professor of Irish and a lexicographer and published the standard English-Irish dictionary. So thanks to his predecessor, we call that the Walter's Dictionary instead of O Walter's Dictionary. 
The same thing happens with first names. I know there's a lot of Americans here who talk about first names and last names. In Ireland, we talk about Christian names and surnames. They mean the same thing. When I went to school and was studying mathematics, we were taught how to remember which was the cosine and which was the sine. C, S, like a Christian name, surname. That wouldn't make sense as a, as a mnemonic to an American learning, basically an American. There were no computers in the old days. It's only because we have computers today we have to spell everything exactly right or the computer won't find it. Language changes over the years. If you go back and read Chaucer's poetry in English, it's very different from the English we speak today. And names, first names and last names were being changed back and forth between different languages. So I like to take some of the common girls' names and say that sometimes you see everything in that list exchanged with the next name on the list. Nora can have an H on the end, or no H. It can be an abbreviation for Honora with an A, or Hanora with an A, or Hanora with an A. If you turn that into Latin, it might be Hanoria. That might be abbreviated as Hannah, spelled any number of ways. That might be just abbreviated as Anna, leaving the H off. But Hannah can also be short for Johanna. Or Johanna can be abbreviated as Josie. And somebody else might find the same Josie who started out as Johanna and decide she must be Josephine. Or it might go back into Irish and Siobhan would be the nearest Irish for that. Or that might be translated back into English as Susan. So you'll often find the same person in one record as Johanna and the other record as Susan. But Johanna might be from the English speaking uh, government official. The Susan might be from the priest or vice versa. And she's probably called Siobhan by her Irish speaking relatives and neighbours every day. And sometimes it turns into Julie, which turns into Judith, which turns into Julia, which goes back into Irish as Sheila. You're not going to get all those variants for the same person. But if you're looking for your Irish ancestors, you've got to be prepared to find that different people record the same person with the Christian name and surname spelled in many different ways. The handwriting was also bad. A lot of these people were certainly illiterate in English and may not have been literate even in their native Irish language. A lot of the records you look at are transcribed by people from other countries who are not familiar with Irish personal names or place names. And even today, I've listed some of the surnames there that great in the year when I hear them from, from overseas. Mahoney, as we call it, is very often called Mahoney when they leave Ireland. Costello, as we call it, is often called Costello when they go abroad. Um, Doherty might be called Doherty or Doherty or any other pronunciation. And these are not just things that changed when one person went through Ellis Island. I found a great example of that the other day. A man I was helping was looking for his great grandfather's record for the last year or two been waiting for the New Jersey authorities to release his death certificate for about six months. Um, but he knew the man as Marinan, and he was known in Ireland as Marinan. But when he went through Ellis Island, just for one day, he became Merryman. And by looking for Marinan, he missed the Merryman. I just happened to be scrolling through records for the relevant parish, and I said, everything there fits apart from the spelling of the surname. And sure enough, he was traveling with Margaret Tati, and her man wrote back very excited. I have a funeral card for Margaret Tati in my archives. I had no idea who she was. So then we're absolutely certain I had found the right man on the, the other side of the list. We didn't have middle names in Ireland. Um, right up almost to my time. I'm very unusual in having two middle names. So I felt at sea when I lived in America for a number of years and I was expected to have only one. I don't have a middle name, I have four names. So two on one side of the middle, two on the other side of the middle. So just because you find a relative in the US or elsewhere overseas with a middle name, don't insist in finding that middle name in Irish records. That was something that they would have had to pick up to conform when they crossed the Atlantic. Um, what we did have here, if there were 24 persons in the same townland, and half of them were called John and half of them were called Dan, well then to distinguish them they would get a patronymic they would use their father's name. So John, son of Michael, would be called John Michael or John Mickey or Sean McGeal or whatever language they wanted to put it in. And then when Sean McGeal went to America, he might become John M. Curtin or John Michael Curtin, but that, uh, that name would not appear in written records in Ireland as a middle name. 
people complain about so many people with the same name in Ireland. I don't know why. <laughs> if you find three Jeremiah Curtains living in the same townland of approximately the same age, well, they're almost certainly three first cousins called after their grandfather Jeremiah, because it was almost universally practiced up to the late 1800s that the first two sons were called after the paternal and maternal grandfathers, the first two daughters after the paternal and maternal grandmothers. You had some variation in which came first, but there were parts of the country where you could even say which was the paternal and which was the maternal. And the third child was called after the parent, if the name hadn't already been used. And the fourth child of each gender was called after the relevant parents or the sibling. So, um, there were other little problems too. We had very high infant mortality. So if you had a Mary Curtin who died when she was a year or two old and another girl came along, but she'd be called Mary Curtin as well. And you might find four Mary Curtins in the same family and you just know that the first three died in infancy. Um, when you look at the church records, you also get the names of the sponsors of baptisms and the witnesses of marriages. And the convention was that they were usually close family members, certainly in the 19th century. It's not so much the same nowadays. Um, and something that you find very often is that when a young mother was having her first child, the first of all, when she married, the marriage always took place in the bride's parish church or the bride's parish. Um, and then she might go to live in the husband's parish, which might be the next parish or two parishes away, or more often than not, it was going to be the same parish. But when she was about to give birth to her first child, if her own mother was still alive, she'd very often go back to her own mother's house for help with having the first child. So you'd find the baptism of the first child in the mother's parish, and then when she knew what was all about, the younger children would be baptized in her husband's parish, in her new parish. And very often you even find that the grandmother is the baptismal sponsor for that first child. You also find the priest will very often write down the names of the sponsors, uh, female sponsors with their maiden surnames. So even though the grandmother might have been married for 50 years at this stage, and she might be, in my case, Catherine Parker, she might be written down as Catherine Dunn as the baptismal sponsor for her granddaughter. And people always complain when they're trying to research that they can't figure out what age their ancestors were. This can't be my ancestor, he's a different age. I found one lady recently, again a Marilyn in West Clare, and she was 39 in the 1901 census, and she did get older by 1911, she was 40. And she died in 1919, but she was still 40. Uh, people didn't know what age they were, and they had no reason to know, they didn't care. The old age pension came in in 1909. Um, my grandfather and his identical twin brother worked in the post office, which was responsible for processing the pension applications. Um, Uncle Patty, as I call him, my great uncle, worked for um, the post office workers magazine. So he wrote this wonderful little article about the introduction of the old age pension scheme which from genealogist's point of view means it was the time when it became important to know your age because if you were 70 you could qualify for a pension. This was only 45 years after civil registration and births came in, so most people had no way of proving their age. Um, if they were lucky they might be from a parish where the baptismal registers had survived and they could use a baptismal certificate to prove their age. But in many cases the best hope they had in proving their age was to prove that they were alive when the census was taken in 1841 or 1851. So if you're very lucky, you might find your ancestor had to apply to the public record office, as it was then known, for a search of the census returns to see whether he or she appeared as an infant in the 1841 or 1851 census. And if you're even luckier, the clerk who checked the record might have written down the names and ages of all the family members and they found the person. Um, I'm not going to read that whole, whole article. Um, the other thing that came in at the same time was Hallmark cards. You know, a multinational which makes a fortune out of people knowing when their birthdays were and when all their friends' birthdays are. Um, I guess Facebook does the same today. 
But also there was all of our cards, there were no birthday cards, and nobody knew their hair and birthday. I couldn't care less when my birthday is. I go on to get any older. I'm happy to be young. I'll tell you one other funny story. I got a letter um, from a relative in the US, which had been sent from mail to Oregon, I think, in the, the late 1800s, where a son had written home to his mother saying, I need to know my birthday. Can you tell me when I was born? And the mother wrote back, well, I'm not sure. It was about the spring of 1849, I think. I could ask the priest to check the baptismal register, but he's collecting money for his new church, and I'm dodging them. <laughs> anyway, to get back to why we're all here today, or everyone except me has a curtain in their ancestry, um, I thought I would look up what two of the authorities on Irish surnames have to say about the surname curtain. Edward McLeisett is a man who lived in Kilgraney on the shores of Loch Derg in East Clare for many years, uh, but also worked in Dublin as the chief herald, the head of the genealogical office in Dublin, and he produced many books on Irish surnames, and I rarely hear anybody questioning any of his deductions. So there's one little bit of paper back to the surnames of Ireland and a couple of lines on every surname. It explains that Curtin, originally Mock Curtin, in Irish began as Mock Curtin, but changed into Mac Curtin. And Curtin, he says, was the Irish word for a hunchback. I wouldn't have known that until I looked this up. But your ancestor must have had a hunchback. Described it as an old Poland set, later found chiefly in County Cork. Well, I guess he's now being called into question by the DNA results. Poland is this area, North Munster, County Clare, and into Limerick. Um, and sure enough, there are curtains from Happy Group Or all over this area. But when he says the set was found chiefly in Cork, well, we know the Cork ones from Dan's talk this morning are Happy Group J, are a completely different lineage. And he says, up to the end of the 16th century, you see it anglicized as Mock and Crotton. And the census taken in 1659, it wasn't a real census, it was just to do with redistributing lands that had been confiscated after Cromwell. The spellings are Mac Curtain, or O Curtain, with an E on the end. Um, and sometimes you see O as well as Mac. Sean Le Beau, uh, published a similar book more recently on surnames. And just says Curtin is numerous, mainly found in North Cork and West Limerick, originally Mark Curtin and Clare, where they were a notable literary family. I'll come back to that later. He says the Irish is now Mock or Oak Curtin, um, so a slightly different spelling to the one that MacLeish had come up with for the Irish. And Dan talked about the Curtin DNA project earlier. I hope anybody who hasn't already sent off their DNA will do so. There's the project page. When you sent off your DNA, if you're a curtain, you just click the join button to join it. And as Dan pointed out on the DNA results page, you find that there are lots of people from Hapta Group J, and then a smaller number from Hapta Group Or. Eventually we'll know that by hope. Let's see if we can. Um, this link. But you find that the Clare people are not the group. There they are. The three corners. And now I know what the three corners is. That means the corner of the three counties. I wonder what that was all about when I looked at this earlier in the week. And there's all your people from Happy Group J. And I guess that's Dan there with his FGC 9962 result from his big Y test. And you have one or two others who've done some SNP tests and have more precise up the groups. And then you have some ores from the Mallow area, the other side of North Cork, North East Cork, rather than North West Cork. And then you have two Clare groups and a few strays. And then people who don't have the curtain surname. Um, it would help if we had the surname and the most distant ancestor showing on that chart. And maybe I could see those if I was a member of the project, which I'm not. Um, there's also on Family Tree DNA a Clare Roots project, which I administer, which is mostly useful for the family finder test that we heard about this morning. Again, any of you who have ancestors from anywhere in Clare are very welcome to join. To 
is picked the join button there beside the house, the two century DNA and family tree DNA. And um, for example, I maintain a list of fair surnames, and you can try and use this to identify how many other people in the project have your ancestral surnames. So if we scroll down here, we see how many of the 630 members each have Curtin as an ancestral surname. Ooh, I haven't even put in Curtin as an ancestral surname. Nobody's asked me to, to get that before I brought it up. So. Uh, I can do that right away, but I think it would go to my projects, head of the project profile, and we'll stick in person as a surname. Just to show you how easy it is to be a project manager. Look in, project is well conceived, and there's our list of surnames, and I keep them in alphabetical order. Tucker and Culligan, Cullen and Cunningham, Curry, Curtin, and save profile. So when you go back and check that yourselves, it will tell you how many people in the project have Curtin ancestry. I should have checked that before I brought it up. Um, the Curtin history in Clare is that they were the hereditary olives, which were bards, poets, and genealogists to the ruling O'Brien family. I mentioned Brian the Rue earlier. The O'Briens were the rulers at least of the Kingdom of Poland for hundreds of years. And all these families from the small Irish kingdoms had other families who filled particular roles for them with the hereditary basis, and the curtains were the poets and the genealogists to the O'Briens. And here's a lovely way of looking at all the curtains in Ireland. This is something done by John Brennan. Some of you who've been to Clare Roots conferences might have heard John speaking, and he's taken the 1911 census data, which is on the National Archives of Ireland website, and he has mapped it using Google Maps. So every district elector and division with a curtain is a red dot on the map, and the more curtains in the district elector and division, the more curtain heads of families, you just look at the heads of households, the more curtains, the larger the size of the red dot. So until I looked at the, this map, I didn't realize, yes, there's where most of the curtains are from in the area where Cork, Limerick, and Kerry meet. But there's quite a scattering around the counties there. There's only one or two in the rest of the country, apart from another group down around Cork City. And you can even zoom in more closely on the map and drag it around and see where, where is this real curtain heartland. Michael was telling me earlier about a road in West Limerick where there were 16 curtain families living next door to each other, is that true? <laughs> My guess is that that's going to be where the biggest circle is on the map. Would it be a knock to all DED? 24 heads of household, all in the same district electoral division, all with the surname curtain. That map is a great way to visualize what part of the country a surname comes from. And you know, the numbers down the left hand side, if you didn't want to zoom in on the map, you can just run your eye down the list of numbers until you see where's the biggest. There's your number two on with 24 in the same district electoral division. So let's talk about a few of the more interesting curtains that I know of. I was asked that I mention that the curtain poets from Clare. Andreas Mokritschin was born sometime in the middle of the 1600s, died about 1738. Uh, he's reputed to have been a native of the townland of Moy Glass. Just to give you an idea, we we'll bring up the other map site, the Ordnance Survey of Ireland map site. You see the little red plus in the middle that marks Moy Glass. It's near the west coast. There's the main road heading out from Ennis here to Milton Molbeck. And down the bottom, you can just about see the main road to Menace heading south. So, somewhere over here on my screen is over there on your screen, um, is where we are today in Venice, and that's where Andreas Makurchin came from. And his most famous work is an address to the leader of the fairies, so the little people of the she, um, a fairy called Donald. Duke Moore. Duke Moore is more famous nowadays. It's a 
areas, sand hills on the west coast, southwest of White Glass, where somebody decided to build it. The Gulf Links, and a certain American gentleman by the name of Trump bought it in a fire sale for half nothing a couple of years ago. Um, but this imaginary being was supposed to preside over the fairies of the district, and McCritchie supplicated him to take his service because he was being neglected by the mortals. The ordinary people, the Orions, were not paying the, the poets and the genealogists and the bards what they used to pay. And he praised the hospitality of the chief of the fairies and thereby was censoring the meanness of the O'Briens or whoever he expected to, to pay him for his work as a poet. And he was one of the great Gaelic scribes. There was very little printing in the Irish language, but there was a lot of exchange of manuscripts especially in there. So you would find people like Andreas McCurchy would copy each other's work, copy histories, copy genealogies, copy poetry, and they would be handed around in manuscript form and in manuscripts. Many have survived down to the present day, and Andreas's are in the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin. And you can read about them on these other standard sites. Wikipedia is a very brief entry in English. Recourse of, we've started out as the Princess Grace Irish Library in Monaco, um, has a lovely database of information on Irish writers of all sorts. And for those who speak the native tongue, there's a great website called Annan.ie. Annan is just named in Irish, and it has a biography in Irish with anybody who did anything of interest or significance in the Irish language. Um, so that's where you get the whole story of Andreas. And I can't find it in the translate button. I'm sure you can copy and paste it to Google Translate if you don't speak Irish. He had a cousin, a Wee Walker Chain, born in 1680. By various years of death, I think 1755 seems to be the agreed year. He came from a little further north. Kilmer Creek is up by the Kipsum Moher, where some of you will be going on Sunday. So, northwest of we are, where we are here, on the west coast of County Clare, near the Scank. And he was born just before the Jacobite Wars. Um, Again, I'm not sure if that 1680 day tallies with some of the stories which say he was one of the flight of the wild geese. The Jacobites were the Catholics led by King James. James is Jacobus in Latin, so they were called the Jacobites. They were at war with the Williamites. James was the Catholic, William was the Protestant, fighting for the thrones of England, Ireland, Scotland, and various other countries, Holland as well. And there were a number of major battles around 1690, the Battle of the Boyne over the East Coast, and then the Siege of Limerick, after which a lot of the Jacobites fled to the European continent and joined continental armies. And it may or may not have been the case that they agreed with one of them, but he was certainly associated with them. But he came back to Ireland in 1714, wrote a history of Ireland, a brief discourse and vindication of the antiquity of Ireland, written in English, and his English was not as good as his Irish, um, but when it was published, he was imprisoned by the judge who didn't like what uh, McCritchie had written about him. Then he went to Louvain in Belgium and wrote the first grammar of the Irish language, Elements of the Irish Language, published in 1728. And he worked with Gregorio Gilgier on an English Irish dictionary. So he was the, the predecessor of the Moscow Ultra, that published a dictionary in Paris in 1732. When Andreas came back in 1738, died in 1738, a wee came back and took up the office of Olive to the O'Briens. And Marco might be saying a little bit more tomorrow about the pedigree, but we think that Andreas didn't marry and a wee married with an only daughter, so I don't think that Olive is the ancestor of any of the care curtains today. But a wee had two daughters who inherited the volumes of manuscript genealogies that he had written and may have made some money out of. I guess being professional genealogists providing information out of, out of those uh, documents. And finally, as recently as 2012, a collection of his poems was put into print. As I said, what he wrote was mostly circulated in manuscript form. Um, it was never published in printed form. But these 21 poems, Oswega in Irish, written by A. Gui, have survived and were finally published five years ago. So. Um, I suspect all the notes and everything are also on Swaika, and the reviews are even on Swaika. But he certainly viewed as one of the most significant poets.
poets of the 18th century. That was the time of the penal laws, I guess from Cromwell on, maybe even more so from the Williamite Wars on, uh, the Catholic Church was suppressed, the Gaelic language was suppressed, right up into the early 1800s. And it was, that's why we have no church records. Most of the priests were on their own. They were worried about their lives rather than about carrying around books of birth, marriage, and death records. And there's very little in print from Irish Gaelic Catholic society from the 18th century because the penal laws were in force. Another man I was asked to investigate is a man I think you're going to honor tomorrow as well. Um, Lawrence Curtin was the only Clare Curtin listed as having died in the First World War. He was only 17, according to the Army records. He was in the 1st Battalion of the Royal Ulster Fusiliers, and he was sent to Gallipoli in 1915, where thousands of Irishmen died. Um, he's reputed to have been born in the little village of Kilbaha. This is a page from a list of the Irish casualties of the First World War, which was printed with this fantastic um, decorative designs in the margin by Harry Clark, who's best known for stained glass windows. And there's Curtin Lawrence, uh, Regimental Number 9787, Private of Royal Monster Fusiliers, 1st Battalion. That says he died of wounds at Gallipoli on May 12, 1915, born in Kilbahar, Carrigahold, County Clare. And Kilbahar is just a typo for Kilbaha. And Kilbaha is the last village on the West Clare Peninsula, the next stop, New York. Uh, there's Kilbaha. A short of the lighthouse. If you're staying around for a few days, I highly recommend doing the driving tour of Bouquet. Once I sit on the kips of over, you don't have to pay to get in. Um, and Kilbaha is right back at the tip. Oops, I keep forgetting the uh, click the pan button if I get to the map via a link. I'll be able to zoom out so that you can see there's Carry the Hold, which is a more significant village than Kilbaha. So even though the Baha had its own post office, for some reason the address gets given as Harry the Hold, and there's Kiltrevig. Kilbaha and Kiltrevig are basically one conglomeration known by both names. So that's where he's supposed to be born. But I can find no record of his birth in the indexes to births. I can find no sign of him in the 1901 census. I can find no sign of him in the 1911 census. Many other people have looked for him and found nothing of him. So I can only conclude that the name in which he, under which he served in the Royal Ulster Fusiliers was not the name by which he was known before he joined up, um, or else the birthplace is wrong. So we're not sure. We do know that his mother was Mary, because there's a register of soldiers' effects, um, which basically lists how much money was due to his next of kin. And he, Next to Lawrence Curtin, three pounds, 18 shillings, and five pence was the pay due to him, I think, when he died. And the war gratuity was a lump sum to his mother on his death of five pounds. Can you see that? Or do I need to zoom in on it? Um, it was to go to his mother, Mary. Another record says she lived in Bray Street in Kilrush. And again, they're not there in the 1911 census. Um, I did find the death of a Mary Curtin in Chapel Street in Kilrush, which is just around the corner, but that wasn't enough to be sure that that was her. I should be watching the time. I have until half past, is it? I'm about, about halfway through. Uh, there's the record on the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and you can see um, somewhere there, cross crouching, cross school. Person. Just known by their first initials, Private L, number 9787, 12th of May 1915, Royal Monster Fusiliers. But when he died of wounds, so he may have been brought back to Alexandria in Egypt, and that's where he's commemorated and probably buried. Uh, but he's also commemorated on two monuments here locally in Kilkee. Um, that's a photograph I took on the day of the unveiling. And just about to make out there, Curtin Lawrence. That's in the church grounds in Kilkee, which again is another bigger town to be east of Harry the Old, where they commemorated the World War I dead of the four local parishes to invade Kilkee, Harry the Old, and Kilpaleon. And there's a new war.
Moore Memorial just on day last November, just around the corner here, where I gather you're going to visit tomorrow. And he's listed there under very old as Lawrence Kirk. So it would be lovely to know who were his parents. Was he really born in Havana? What name did he go by? So someday we might crack the puzzle, but at the moment it's a mystery to us. I was trying to think of what Kirk's I knew or heard of when I was growing up, and I thought my grandmother was Sis McNamara from Mobin, back between Kilkee and Carrigan which I just talked about. Uh, her half brother, Patrick McNamara, was a blacksmith or a farrier, as it might be called today, and he took on a number of apprentices, and at least one of his apprentices did fairly well. He was from Shrap. That's the map of Shrap. They play a lot of cards in West Clare. And the Ace of Spades is always called the Map of Shrap. Um, the Ace of Hearts is called the Bonham. A Bonham is the Irish word for a piglet. So they have all these nicknames. But the real Map of Shrap, to show you where Mikey came from, um, is between Kilrush and Dunbeg. That's Shrasoo, marked with the red plus. This is the West Clare Peninsula, the Atlantic Ocean, the Shannon Estuary is down at the bottom. I zoom out, you get a better feel. Um, and it's just off the railway. Shrap was a large area of bog. Uh, Limerick City at the head of the Shannon Estuary was heated by turf, which was brought up in turf boats on the Shannon Estuary to the city from places like Shrap. And eventually when the railway came in, it went through Shrap and they brought the turf up by rail. But the estuary, the river estuary down here, is the motorway of its day. That was how people got back and forth from Limerick to the the other big towns which were all on the estuary. The interior of there was relatively unpopulated, but no big towns, so you can rush here and get to Pan. Over on the other side, you have Valley Longford, Tarbert, and further up, you have Glyn, and eventually we get to Boynes. So all these towns along the river were basically the stops of the motorway of the day. Travel was originally by sailboats, steamboats came in in the 1830s, um, and it was only in the 1890s that it was considered that it was economical to have the railway taking the place of steam traffic on the river to transport goods and people um, around counties Clare, Limerick, and Kerry. So, this is like another three county point back here where Clare, Limerick, and Kerry come together in the middle of the Shannon Estuary, and if we go down uh, a little further along the county boundary, which runs along the Fergus River, here's the other three county points where Cork, Limerick, and Kerry come together, so that's your heart and heartland. Of oh, the other bench of the heart is down there. Anyway, back to Mikey Kirk. I met a man the other day whose ancestors lived in Shra, and he came up with this lovely description of Shrap. He says, people used to say Shrap was a very comfortable place to live. They had lots of curtains and lots of cushions. But they were the surnames, not the luxuries in the house. And I actually found Michael Kirk and married Laura Cushion, and they had three children baptized in the local parish between 1876 and 1879. And I'm not certain, but I suspect these are the blacksmith Michael Curtin's Father is probably James, honor is probably his grandmother. He was born about 1919 19 or 1920, I think. But when he acquired his qualification in blacksmithing, he moved to London and he got a job shoeing horses in the vicinity of Buckingham Palace. Mostly horses for the London Metropolitan Police, but also the horses of the royal family. Um, so there's Michael Curtin from Shra. And the source says this is Queen Elizabeth II, which to me looks like her mother. And it was Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, who lived to well over a hundred, and meeting the man who had maybe not shot her horse, she was only too old to be riding. Um, but there's a link here to a radio documentary first broadcast back in 1981, uh, and it's very interesting to listen to. A man that grew up as a blacksmith's apprentice in, in County Clare and ended up. Mixing with royalty to the extent that at least he was shooting their horses, and that the Queen of England would have been in her late 50s and her husband in her 60s at that stage, but they were still riding regularly on their own horses, and he was the man that, that shot the horses every few weeks when they needed to be reshot. 
and in 2011 there was a big fuss made in Ireland and there was a state visit by the Queen of England, which was seen as peace finally breaking out after 800 years of war between England and Ireland. The local newspaper, the Clare Champion, went ferreting for some connection between Clare and the royal family. And the only West Clare link to the Queen of England that they could put up with was Michael Curtin, who shot the Queen's horses. So you can read all of that in there. And I did check the records, and he did continue to be known as Curtin, but I had heard some of the, the local people say he actually changed his name to Curtis when he started working with the Royals, because he thought Curtin sounded too Irish, I'm not sure is there any truth in that rumor. And I did find, when I looked for the Curtains of Shra, in case there's anybody else descended from the Curtains of Shra, this is a page I'll come back to later. Um, listing the people who went through Ellis Island from the parish of Dinbeck, in which Shra is, to America. And there we have Mighty Cooley, age 30, born 1884, went in 1914 on the Mauritania. From Liverpool, his mother was Mrs. Cooley in Shra. And he was going to his cousin James de Lufry in Jersey City, traveling with his nephew Joseph Curtin. And if we jump down to Joseph Curtin, Joseph was only 10 um, on the same ship on the same day. His nearest relative at home was his uncle Thomas de Lufry, but his father Michael Curtin was already in Jersey City. So the father had gone off and left the young son at home, and an uncle later brought the son out to him. So, sure, but we don't have any descendants of that family here. But he stumbled across things like this from time to time. Um, the Three Corners, as we call it, or Curtain Corner, is in the heart of Sliwlucra, which is one of the most famous areas in Ireland for traditional music. And they have a festival there called the Curtain Cur Cur Traditional Music Festival. I hope it's still going. The webpage hasn't been updated since 2015, um, but that's at least one curtain. Musicians it wouldn't be the most famous of the Steve Luker musicians, but he was famous enough to have a music festival called after him in his lifetime. Um, my other passion in life was horse racing, and I guess the curtain that I knew best in that world was a racehorse trainer born in Limerick, trained up in the Curra, which is the heartland of horse training in Ireland. There's his picture, Ted Curtin, who was pretty successful. He trained for some very wealthy Americans, including a man called Nelson Bunker Hunt, you might have heard of, who monopolized the world silver market at one stage and had a huge string of racehorses. Um, and then I think the silver market collapsed and he went bankrupt. Another man called Franklin Groves, with Ted Curtin, two horses who anybody who knows about horse racing in the US might have heard of. One was Exceller. Ted Curtin bought him for $25,000. He won one and a half million in prize money in the 1970s um, when there weren't many million dollar races. And I think at one stage he beat Seattle Slough and the Berg, who were the last two Triple Crown winners in America for, before American Pharaoh a couple of years ago. So he was right at the top of American racing. The first ever million dollar race was the Arlington Million in 1981 won by John Henry many times horse of the year. Again, he won by a nose, and this time it was Ted Curtin's horse that was second, the Bart, who was owned by Franklin Groves. So I was interested to hear Dan saying earlier that the um, Curtins had the same white DNA as the rulers of the United Arab Emirates, and I wonder does that include the Maktoum family who are now the, the people who keep the world horse racing industry going, they have oil wells in their back garden, and they plan the profits into buying horses all over the world. But maybe there are 74 cousins of Ted Curtin. Um, a local historian in West Limerick, Derek Curtin, has published a couple of books, uh, one on the place names of West Limerick, which I often quote when I talk about place names. And again, I warned you that names are fluid in Ireland. That includes the place names. Got to try and find what townland your ancestor lived in, and then work out what parish was that townland in, what district electoral division was it in for the census, what registration district was it in for births, marriages, and deaths, what parish was it in for church purposes, as well as what civil parish was it in for land valuation purposes. Um, the parishes go back to medieval times when the Reformation.
Reformation happened, the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church basically took the parishes as they stood in the 1500s and they might have gradually tweaked the borders or merged two small parishes into a bigger one or split a bigger one. So we ended up with two systems of parishes in Ireland by the 1800s. The Ordnance Survey was set up to map them and put the boundaries on the maps. But the Catholic Church had been doing its own thing for a few hundred years at this time, and we find differences in parish boundaries. Um, so Jerry Curtin puts it nicely. He says the details on Catholic parish boundaries, researched by Emery Garfield and Family Ancestry, may not be seen as correct in a small number of parishes, as in my travels I came across varied opinions of Catholic parish boundaries. In cases that would put forward that people in certain areas were paying their church dues to a certain parish or playing their football or hurling with another parish team. But where townlands are divided between parishes, the whole situation was locally generally confused. The boundaries of the civil parishes and the later Catholic parishes were in almost all cases totally different. If you want to know more about that, on my website you'll find various talks I've given about the subject. There's one I gave about three years ago to a genealogy event in Limerick talk for hours about administrative divisions in Ireland. And Jared's other better known book is A Fall for War in West Limerick, 1845-49, which is about the famine period in the area where all the curtains come from in West Limerick. Uh, another curtain I know is Sean Curtin in Limerick, a photographer who for the last 16 years has brought out a book every year called Limerick to Stroll Down Memory Lane, Volume 1 up to Volume 16. So if you have any connection to Limerick City, these books are fascinating. Look back at some of the oldest photographs that have survived. Photographs any time from the beginning of photography up to colour photography in some cases. But he's a great character as well. Another person who's made himself famous. And I have no curtain ancestors myself, so I decided I would look in my family tree DNA, family finder matches to see how I had any Curtin cousins. And I found that Frank Curtin, with whom on chromosome 15, I share a 17 centimorgan half-identical region of DNA, which might make him anything from a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh cousin. And as Dan said this morning, what good are the DNA results if you've no pedigree free to go with them? He has not filled in nearly his known ancestors, not filled in his ancestral surnames, not put up his family tree. I suspect he's the Frank Curtin, who was the vice chief of the clan at one stage. So whoever is the beneficiary of his account, please fill in the genealogical details so that I can figure out how I'm related to him. I have relatives from the Stowe and County Kerry and from other matches. I think he might fit my feet on that side of my family if he's related. And if you're still alive, please fill in your genealogy details on your DNA profile tonight. So I will ask to say a little bit about sources that you can use to trace your ancestors. And I'll start with sources that apply to the whole country. First thing to do is to talk to the older and the more knowledgeable family members. We're not necessarily the same people. Take down or record everything they have to say, but then go off and verify what they say because family legends change with the telling. Um, somebody said earlier, if you get stuck trying to go back to your direct ancestors, it helps to go sideways. I envy the Australians who can find death certificates from the mid to late 1800s, naming the parents of their ancestors who were born in Ireland in the late 1700s. I've been able to find siblings of my ancestors who went to Australia and used the Australia death certificates to fill in the blanks. So don't just go with tunnel vision on the direct ancestors. Follow the brothers and sisters around and see what information you can find on them. Don't believe everything you're told. There's always a grain of truth. There's no smoke without fire. But these stories get embellished, forgotten, garbled in various ways. So when you gather what you can from the family, where everybody seems to start in Ireland is the census, which, thanks to a great recovery chair woman, Katrina Crow, was the director of special Pro projects of the National Archive. Her father was from Clare. And this 
The census was taken every 10 years from 1821. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the 1841 and 1851 returns were used for verified old age pension applications. So they were stored in the Public Record Office of Ireland in the Four Courts building in Dublin. And there was a civil war in 1922 and 1923 between those who wanted to accept a treaty with the rest of the United Kingdom and those who wanted to fight for a greater degree of independence. And the Republican side, as we call those, the anti-treaty side, occupied the Public Record Office as sort of the headquarters in Dublin and took some of the ancient large books of records and used them as barricades to barricade out the windows and wire the whole building with explosives. The pro-treaty side, the Free Staters, decided they were going to bomb the Republicans out of this building. And the whole National Archive of Ireland went off with one big bang and sheets of charred paper landed for a 30 mile radius around the centre of Dublin. And that was the end of the census returns that we really would love to have for 1821, 31, 41, and 51. The verbatim of the 1861, 71, 81, and 91 censuses is anything a little sadder. Um, every household got a household form to complete, and then the enumerator copied the forms into an enumerator's book. And the same system basically worked more or less the same in England and Ireland. Except in Ireland, uh, the household returns were retained the enumerator's books were disposed of when the statistical summaries had been printed. In Britain, they did it the other way around. They disposed of the household returns and they retained the enumerator's book. So somebody in Dublin sent a letter to somebody in London saying, do we really need to keep all these household returns from the old censuses? And the guy in England wrote back and said, well, we pumped ours or didn't keep ours, so I don't think you need to keep yours. So that was a paper shortage during the First World War, and they were recycling paper, and they pumped four sets of census returns. So we are left with just 1901 and 1911. Thankfully, they're online. They're reasonably searchable. There's a link to the search form. The transcriptions are not perfect. You can use wildcards. Um, and make sure to use the other search options. You can search by things like occupation, religion, uh, number of years married, any field in the census, you can search by it. So you might be tempted to just put in curtain, but that won't pick up AIM. So maybe you should use a wildcard to pick up a possible A, and in case there's an E on the end, something like that would pick up some of the variants of curtain. And sure enough, there's three curtains with both the A and the E, and presumably the same household in Cork, lots of curtains with an A, you might have missed them if you just put in the spelling that you use in the, the clan title. There's the three C's, the census records, the church records, and the civil birth, marriage, and death records. Um, the church records more recently were put online by the National Library of Ireland. Somehow all the important genealogical records have ended up in the hands of different government quangos. Um, again, if you need a little bit of local knowledge, I'm going to search for Carrie Hold, which we mentioned earlier, where we think Lawrence Curtin might have been from. And you get the microfilms that you can scroll through, and these have been transcribed and indexed on Ancestry.com and FindMyPast.com. And I think one of them is supposed to be free, the other might only be available for subscribers. And you have a map over here. Um, no, I can't get the map to go full screen. Um, so it appears that Carrigahoe Parish is that whole area, which it was in 1853 at the time of the earliest surviving records. But the parish priest died in 1878, and this had originally been two parishes, and it was split across the middle there into two parishes again. Um, I need to go through to that. If we scroll down, you'll find there's a second pillar with records from 1878 to 1881, and you'll think that they're for the same geographical area. And in fact, they're from Kilbaddyo, the western half of the parish. 
and the records for 1878 to 1881 for the eastern half of the parish are not online at all. So again, don't despair if you don't find it. Find somebody local with that sort of local knowledge of when the boundaries were changed. Um, nothing stayed static. Uh, the civil records, there's been a little bit of a, a farce, a, bit, a row between two governments. Quang goes about putting these online. Um, I think our banking system has been overtaken by the practices in multinationals from jurisdictions where birth, marriage and death records are private records. When civil registration of births, marriages and deaths was brought in in England and Wales in 1837, in Scotland in 1855 and in Ireland in 1864, these records were deemed to be public records and anybody could go into any office and get a copy of any certificate. So that if you wanted to check when you were marrying somebody, if they were married already and committing bigamy, you could look for their early marriage record, or if you were trying to prove your claim to an estate or get your Irish passport or whatever, you could get the records of other people. But there is this myth out there now that even in a jurisdiction where these are public records, a person carrying a birth certificate is the person named as a birth certificate. That is not the case, has never been the case. If your financial institution acts as if that is the case, you shouldn't trust them with your money. Uh, but there's also, in more recent times, I think driven mainly by European legislation, a data protection commissioner in Ireland who thinks that all personal records should be private records, despite the legislation going back to 1863 saying otherwise. And there is a Data Protection Act, and it does refer to records relating to living persons. So when these records were put online about two or three years ago, there was a war between the Registrar General and the Data Protection Commissioner, and they were taken down after about two weeks, including the death records, over which the Data Protection Commissioner has absolutely no jurisdiction. But last year, um, there was a compromise reached, and the birth records for 1864 to 1915, which is all the birth records over 100 years old at the time, the time the project got off the ground. The marriage records from about 1881 to 1940, all those over 75 years old, but not the very earliest ones. And again, the death records over 50 years old, but not the very earliest ones, are online and were promised the missing 1864 to 1881 marriages and 1864 to 1891 deaths will be online soon. But God knows what soon means. And you can search these and find whatever you want. Um, but you have to go through various hoops. You have to sign a declaration. And I just tend to put in two initials. It doesn't care what you put in. Don't waste your time typing your full name. So for example, I wanted to see could I find Lawrence Curtin's mother. So I just put in Mary Curtin. And she's supposed to have been living in Kilrush which happens to be a civil registration district. And we find, I think there was about eight of them, but we have to go through another loop uh, before it actually let us see the results. These are very infuriating things, and it stands out after about 10 minutes, and it takes way too long to come up. It's going to ask, prove you're not a robot. Oh, make a cup of tea while you're waiting for it to come back. This is complete, all these are completely free records that I'm talking about. I've decided I will just keep it in the free ones because doing Irish genealogy does not need to cost you money. Well, I'll come to some of the, the commercial services later on. Anyway, I'll, I'll come back and I'll show you that later. I just don't want to know. Uh, so we've got to be inventive because of the loss of the 19th century census records. And we have a thing called Griffiths Valuation, which was used for property taxes, uh, which took many years to cover the whole country. In County Clare, it was mostly printed in 1855, but it covers every piece of land and building in Ireland, gives a valuation, which is a, an annual rental valuation, not a capital valuation, but more importantly, it gives the name of the head of the household in the building. And you can search this um, by name or by place. So we can just say, show us all the curtains in Ireland. 
and it tells us that 1,231 curtain occupiers occupying property in Ireland during the period when the valuation was comprised. And you can click on this link to see the original printed form in a really horrible image viewer. Um, I'll put pro oops, and somewhere down there we should find a curtain, Samuel, Samuel curtain. And way off the bottom of the page, there's a zoom control. So you have to scroll down to do the zoom control. And there he is, Samuel Burton renting a house from Randall McAllister. And then you touch the wrong button on the keyboard and it zooms out again. <laughs> In what year was the valuation? Uh, they started in 1848 and they finished in 1864, so different years for different counties. Anyway, now we can go back and show you the birth, marriage, and death records if we can prove we're not a robot that wants us to pick the trains. There's usually three, but I see four trains there. Verify and submit. And you get a list of all the Mary Cartons whose deaths were registered in the Kilrush Registration District, which is the whole of the West Clare Peninsula. And we sort them by date because we know she was alive in 1915 when her son died in the First World War. So we can skip all the ones up to 1907. And we get an age of death. So she's not the one who died age 13, but she had a son age 17. She's probably not the one who was 35 in 1918 unless she was a teenage bride. So she would be any of these last three. And I think the 19 one was the Chapel Street Kilrush one. So you get the summary there, and then you click on the image link, and you get a PDF file with a whole page from the register. So this makes it really time consuming because if you're studying an area that you know well, you recognize everyone else on the page, and you have to go off and record them and follow up on those clues. So this is Kilrush Town, and there she is, number 424. Died on the 28th of May 1944 at Chapel Street, Kilrush. Mary Curtin, female, widow, 80 years old, housekeeper, senility. Mary Ledan at Chapel Street, present at death. It doesn't say what the relationship was with the informant. Um, at that point, John Masterson was the son. So that's some help. And if you have a nephew or a grandchild or a married daughter or something, you get more information out of the informant. Oh, she could be the mother of the soldier, but just not enough information on the certificate to tell us. Um, what else do we have? I've shown you these ordnance survey maps earlier. Um, they're an absolutely fantastic resource. The ordnance survey came just before Griffith's valuation. It mapped the country between the 1820s and early 1840s. That's the present day map. That's the Tampa Gate Hotel where we are. But the nice thing here is you can see a satellite view from 2005. You can zoom in and out over here. Or you can go back and see the original map from around 1840. So there's what Ennis looked like in 1840. Um, can't go right here, sorry, on the 1840 version. So that's roughly where we are. Or you can go to a 25 inch to the mile version from about 1900. Again, it took many years to map the whole country, and we can't even tell from these maps the exact date when they were drawn. They were drawn as large sheets of paper with the dates in the margin. So they've been digitized by cutting off the margins and stitching all the sheets together, so they've thrown away the date information. Um, so there's the convent of the Sisters of Charity, convent schools, um, and chapel. So that's probably where we are. This was the original chapel. So that's very helpful in getting a feel for exactly where your ancestors lived. And on the Griffiths valuation, you have the link to a map. Unfortunately, the online map was maybe 10 or 20 years after Griffiths valuation, so it's not always easy to line it up. But it's this map with the individual holdings outlined on it. So you can switch back and forth between the two of them to find out exactly where the person probably lived at the time of Griffith's valuation. And then we have Google Street View. And on the, or on the Griffith's valuation map, you can also switch back and forth to the Google Maps, and then you can go to the main Google Maps site, and 
built in exactly where your ancestors lived as it is today. But then you're out of the map. But yeah, I could go for a whole hour about that. And on my website, you'll find a few other presentations where I've done just that. So I think this has changed a little bit. This was October 2012, and it was called the Bistro, and I think it's now called Legends. So they even drove in and filmed from the car park side of the hotel. Um, so let me just say a little bit about Clare history. One of my specialities is the history of the famines in Clare. Um, and I found a slight, a slight curtain connection. Um, everybody knows about the famine of 1845 onwards. There's some debate as to when it ended. In Clare, it was as bad in the early 1850s as in 1845, starting up to about 1852. Um, I know in Kilrush Town was the only place in Clare where the population increased from the 1841 to the 1851 census because there were something like 5,000 people in the workhouse system in Kilrush Town at the 1851 census in a town that had maybe only 5,000 people outside the workhouse. And when I say the workhouse system, the workhouse was built for 800 people and as they had 5,000 inmates all starving them unable to feed themselves, they took over every large building in the town as an auxiliary workhouse at the time. So there was a famine in 1740 caused not by potato blight, which started in the 1845 famine, but by an Arctic winter, a very cold winter where the whole country froze up for months. And the death toll from that was proportionately much larger. The population 100 years earlier was much smaller. And I say something like a million, I think, died in the 18. In the 1740 famine of a population of maybe three or four million compared to a million and a half from about eight million in the 1840s famine. And in the townland where my grandmother was born, there's a graveyard called Kid Kashin Graveyard. We have a Facebook page about it. One of the many committees I'm on is the, the Cordia Kid Kashin, Friends of Kid Kashin, because this graveyard has been in the middle of a farmer's field for generations with cattle grazing on it. Um, but we know it's a very ancient graveyard. There it is marked on the 1840 map on the boundary between Kilkashin townland and Mobin townland on the other side of the red line. Um, you can read all about it on that Facebook page. Eugene O'Curry, one of the successors of the Mokritines, as one of the great Gaelic scholars in County Clare, was employed by the Ordnance Survey in recording local history, and he wrote about this place which is where his own grandfather had lived. He said Kilkashin was a deserted burying place in the year 1739. In this ensuing year, famine and pestilence raged through the country, and dead human bodies were to be met with by the roads and ditches. And Eugene O'Curry's grandfather, known as Wenok and Gorwick O'Curry, Malachi O'Curry, was a large tenant farmer, he said, a tenant had will being a papist, it was the height of the penal laws, he was a Catholic, he wasn't entitled to any sort of tenure on his land, and he gathered up the family dead and he buried them in Kikashin graveyard. It was long disused before 1740, so it must be one of the oldest graveyards in the country. And our little committee would love to fence it in, put up a monument, some signage and a path across the land so people could get in and visit it. Um, it was subsequently used as what we call a killeen, a small little graveyard where unbaptized babies were buried. Only baptized Catholics were allowed to be buried in Catholic graveyards if you were unbaptized, or if you had committed a mortal sin by like taking your own life, or if you were a stranger who would come to the area or a body washed up on shore or whatever, you couldn't be buried in consecrated ground. But every parish had several of these little killeenies. So my great grandmother supposed to have had about five children who were taken by the fairies at birth. That's how they described it, the death of a young child, and they're almost certainly buried in this graveyard. And the secretary of our committee is none other than one Assumpta Concanon, formerly Assumpta Curtain, and she also has family members buried in Kilkeshian graveyard. So there are curtains buried there, that's why I thought I'd talk about it to you. Um, there are, I don't think there are any 
inscriptions. There are memories of adult burials there up to 1950, but there's only about four large uninscribed flag, flag tombstones there. The Thonian graveyards in Kilrush, I have worked on the restoration of the Kilrush churchyard. This is another very old graveyard. There's a church that goes back before the Reformation. Plus that is the Church of Ireland, the Protestant Church, built in 1813, when they expanded the graveyard. And there are many of these sites which are trying to put online images and transcriptions of Irish graveyards. So historic graves is one of the, the most sophisticated and easy, easiest to do sophisticated searching on. Um, I'm about 10 minutes, so I'm going to start to skip some of this stuff and we won't get it all in. Then we had the major famine in 1845 onwards. If you have read anything about the famine of 1845, you would have seen the sketches that were published in the Illustrated London News that are used to illustrate all Irish history books. They were all sketched at the end of 1849 and early 1850 in the area around the Rush and West there, at Bridget O'Donnell and her children after they had been evicted. There's about 20 of these. Um, possibly the most famous is Miss Kennedy distributing clothing in Kilrush. Miss Kennedy was the daughter of an army officer who was appointed a poor law inspector when the local government system couldn't cope at the height of the famine with people pouring into the workhouse. And even at the age of seven or eight, she took pity on the starving decided she was going to give clothes away and then people started to spend her clothes and send money and so on. And this is her with the, the workhouse officials behind her in their top hats and the starving peasants in the rags around her handing out clothing. She ended up becoming the Countess of Clan William. She was the great grandmother of the infamous Lord Lupin. So it's amazing how within three or four generations uh, families can go in different directions. And I was heavily involved in a national famine commemoration which held every year moves around the country and was in to the rush in 2013. Um, you're on your way shortly to the County Clare Library, so say me, let me say a little bit about sources for genealogy in Clare. As Bernadette said, when she introduced me, I'm the chairperson of the Clare Roots Society. There are many of these local societies in counties around the country. And even within Clare, we have many local history societies. I was asked to do a commercial for East Clare Heritage, which publishes an annual journal, the Steve Octi Journal. You can buy these from Michael McNamara here for 10 euro afterwards. Clare Roots Society meets like most societies once a month. Um, don't think any of you came to our talk last night, the first Thursday of the month. Is anyone there? No? It was up the other hotel, the Old Grand Hotel. We've had three international conferences with Bernadette and others have been to. We've brought out over 20 publications, local histories, mostly on individual streets in the town of Ennis and other other bits and pieces about the county, which would be of use to genealogists for generations to come. We have a website and a Facebook page, which you can check out. Uh, the biggest audience for Popping notes and asking questions about their genealogy is the Facebook group, County Fair Ireland Genealogy, which has 3,000, some number of members, um, 3,724 members, all recruits in there, all interested in doing genealogy in there. So if you're on Facebook, check that out. If you're not on Facebook, it's worth joining Facebook. Just be part of that group and you can turn off everything else. Um, before Facebook took off, we had the Clare Past Forum, which is jointly set up by the Clare County Library and the Library of Canada, another discussion group. Um, it has, I think, 1,000 and something members, 1,574 users, so it's completely dwarfed now by the Facebook group. You can search these, see how many current discussions there are in the group. Stick in curtain in the search box. Um, there's only 20 messages out of many thousands um, referring to curtains. So you might like to follow those up and see if you learn anything new. Then we have the local study centre that we're on our way over to shortly. Last but not least, um, 
like any library, is trying to put itself out of business by putting all its records online so that it doesn't have to cope with people tracing into it. You'll be totally shocked by the fact that your 60 curtains arriving in together with the Palooza that you're told are coming. There is a fantastic website. Um, check the opening hours page, which tells you it's open to late o'clock this evening, open to late on Fridays, and opens on Saturday mornings if you want to go off and check something tomorrow morning or stay around until Monday. And there you have a list of some of the things that they have, but I thought I would just highlight um, what I had found most useful when I was preparing this talk. I discovered that the life stories of Andreas McRitchie and I'm going to say Wee McRitchie are on the website, written by Michael McMahon. Um, there is a genealogy page which lists all the digitized genealogical resources to do with Claire. An index to Griffith's valuation, which sometimes is easier to use than the, the national version, the tithe appointments, which were an earlier taxation thing. Uh, the census for 1901 was on the Clare Library website maybe 10 years before the national website was put together, and lots of other obscure records, directories, donated material, indexes to place names. Spend years going through all that material. And that's just the genealogy stuff. Um, they also host transcriptions for many graveyards. Some of these now were done back in the 1980s and only put online more recently. So it may be the case that if you go to the graveyard, there'll be a more recent inscription. Some of them have photographs attached, some of them don't. But there's dozens and dozens of graveyards there. Then there's a local history page. Um, dozens and dozens of bits and pieces of local history. It's all searchable. There's a search this website button at the top of each page. And we talked about the Great Famine. I showed you Miss Kennedy distributing clothing. Her father was basically from the landlord class and within a few weeks of coming to work in Kilrush, he wrote, there are times when I'm tempted to take my shotgun down off the door and go out and shoot the first landlord I meet because the landlords were evicting those who couldn't afford to pay the rent, couldn't afford to feed themselves, were already starving, were thrown them out on the side of the road. And Captain Kennedy documented those who were evicted during his couple of years in Kilrush. And all these reports listing the names of those who were evicted are on the website. So, for example, in Querent, there were 78. There were four families evicted on the same day, and one of them was the widow Bridget Kirk, who was living in a row. It was one person in total, one female. It was three people in total, two males and one female. She had only a fraction of an acre, and she owed one pound twelve shillings. So there were three places I found curtains: Kilpally Owen and Gerard. Um, we had a Michael curtain, a family of five, two males and three females. They just had a cabin. John Curtin, who was a tailor, three males and three females evicted. Peter Curtin, four people, two males and two females just had a cap. They would all have ended up moving into the workhouse in Kilrush if they didn't die on the side of the road. And in Tarman, we had one Curtin as well. Uh, the, well, one Curtin family, the widow Curtin and her son, with a total of ten people, four males and six females, and they had five acres. Uh, it's horrendous to read those. They're just the names, but to actually read his description of his emotion that witnessing these events is it's horrendous. So what we're going over to see is some of the offline resources. There's a fantastic card catalogue in which Peter Byrne, the librarian, continues to index new material that comes in, down to individual newspaper articles and journal articles that come out. We got that journal, he spent half a day going through and making index cards for the card catalog about every name that appears on it. What I use most often is the local newspapers. They have the Clare Champion in hard copy from about the 1930s up to the present day. We have an index there from 1935 to 1985, and it's all alphabetical, so we can see how many curtain entries there are. And there's Quite a few, so you can pull those hard copy newspapers off the shelves and read about those individual curtains. Before 1933, the newspapers are only in microfilm. They only have three microfilm readers. I'm not sure how we're going to share them among 60 or so people. But my colleagues in the Care Roots Society came together a couple of years ago and went through 
The Clare Champion was established in 1903. There were other older County Clare newspapers, and they went through the microfilms and indexed at least the birth, marriage, and death notices for that 30 year period. Again, you can look up the index online and figure out what date you need, and then go pull out the microfilm and find your individual curtains. Um, should we have a Lawrence curtain at the Milton Mulvey? That is obviously. Uh, doesn't seem to be the one who died in the First World War. Um, I guess he died in May, not in December. So there's only a handful of curtains. There's a lot less death notices. A smaller paper, and less people bothering to put notices in the paper in its first few years. So you've all those other older newspapers as well. And as we walk over from here, I just thought I'd say there are curtains everywhere. Uh, I mentioned Asante earlier, who's the secretary of the Court of Kikeshi and Graveyard Committee with me. Her brother Michael is an accountant with a local accountancy business. Curtain over you, look out for it on your left hand side. Um, and there's the brass plate on the door. So there are curtains everywhere. So that's basically it. I hope you'll 